The Rustins were a brother and sister uh, who, in 1920, uh, came to uh, Havana at the invitation of a Cuban student in a prep school that Mr. Rustin was teaching at at the time. And it's the beginning of the history of the creation of Rustin Academy. In 1920, when the Rustins opened their school in Cuba, in the neighborhood of Marianao, they did so with three students and three teachers. Forty years later, this school would be named by the Inter-American School Service of the United States Department of State as the best American school in Latin America. What justifies this level of recognition was the result of hard work and dedication by a team of educators led by Hiram Rustin, a Harvard graduate and experienced educator who was indeed a man before his time. His design and implementation of an individual-centered education program would nurture and help each student develop his or her potential while making learning a rich and vivid experience. Hiram Rustin was 51 years old when he started this journey. Uh, in, in Cuba, uh, and his life is just an incredible one. My mother once said that Hiram Rustin was the happiest man that she had ever seen. Not for all the things that he had or did, but that he enjoyed life to the fullest, but in ways that really were focused on service, on education, on concepts of, of education. By the end of 1920, an economic crisis in Cuba forced a move to a small house in the neighborhood of El Vedado that became known as the He y Quinta building. For the next 10 years, this small house with its bedrooms and open air porch converted to classrooms was the home of Rustin Academy, the Rustins, and of the few students in the initial boarding program who lived as a family in the facilities that by evening would become a residence. The school's sitting room at night became Mr. Rustin's bedroom. With a growth and expansion in the 1930s, new space was added with typical colonial houses similar to and around the He y Quinta facility. By 1946, Rustin Academy had become a school of about 400 students and 50 teachers. There we had a transformation over a period of some 20 years of Mr. Rustin was successful in drawing students, but as he drew more students, he needed more space. And he was fortunate that there were multiple houses that he was able to get for rent as he grew. And many of them were integrated. In other words, the main patio of the, the Hey Quinta building uh, was connected to a garden that was on the other side of this wall. And essentially, Mr. Rustin created a, an incredible, incredibly, uh, complex scheduling in order to get maximum use from the, the, uh, the buildings. Mr. James D. Baker, who later became the headmaster of Ruston Academy, was working on his master's degree in English at Harvard after graduation from Miami University in Ohio. Upon the recommendation of the president of Miami University, 
also former classmate of Mr. Rustin at Harvard, Mr. Baker accepted Mr. Rustin's invitation to join him in Cuba as a member of the Rustin Academy faculty. Two years later, his wife, Sybil Baker, followed him to Cuba and also became a teacher in the school. By pure happenstance, somebody that had been a teacher of his in uh, Miami, this is in Ohio, uh, happened to have a friend who wrote to him and said, I'm running a school in Cuba and I'm interested in getting a, a man to come down here and teach. So they offered him a job and in those days you didn't say no to any <laughs> job. So he went down there. For him, it was a, first of all, it was a job and second of all, it was an adventure. They left Cuba in 1936 to return at Mr. Rustin's request in 1944. Now with two sons and aware of the impending responsibility due to Mr. Rustin's deteriorating health. The Rustins determined that the ownership of the school would pass to the Bakers upon their death. Hiram Rustin passed away in 1946 and his sister Martha in 1951. The 1930s was a decade of growth and expansion for Rustin Academy. Its curriculum had started out as a tutorial program for a few high school students. Then came the development of a lower school, Bachillerato, Cuba's secondary education program, and the very innovative Comercio program, a combination of technical and academic courses that prepared students for immediate entry to the workplace. At the same time, a kindergarten was also added. The design and management of this encompassing curriculum evolved. Estela Agramonte was in charge of the bachillerato program. Sybil Baker and Mario Iglesias, one of Preston Academy professors, focused on the lower school. James Baker was largely responsible for the high school and educators Felipe and Minerva de la Cruz and Mary Suarez developed and nurtured the Comercio program. The quality of the teachers more than anything uh, that made it, you know, absolutely exceptional. The students are very good, but uh, also, so I learned from my fellow students, but it was the professors, people like our um, history professor had a PhD uh, in um, philosophy and history from the University of Heidelberg. That was Professor Boris Goldenberg. Um, our math teacher had degrees in physics and mathematics. Uh, our Spanish teacher in Spanish literature. We had, and they were absolutely dedicated to us. I've never seen anything like it. When James and Sybil Baker inherited Rustin Academy, they began to implement a plan to change the school into a nonprofit foundation, modeled after the great private schools of the United States and England, and a total new concept for Cuba. This legal status would provide financial security and the basis to secure donations for those interested in the school, a group that already existed in an advisory capacity. Mr. Rafael Palacios and Mr. Phil Rosenberg, two very prominent businessmen and fathers and grandfathers of two generations of Rustin graduates and alumni, had been friends and close advisors of Mr. Rustin and later Mr. Baker. Both joined the foundation board, formally established on April 27, 1951. Mr. Palacios was the first president and laid the cornerstone of the new building. Mr. Rosenberg also served as president. Other notable and well-known leaders in the community were Elena Mederos, founder of the School of Social Work of the University of Havana and recognized advocate of human rights causes such as women and children's rights, and Herminio Portel Vila, prominent historian, writer, and university professor. We inherited the school in 19, uh, after the death of his sister, and uh, so we set it up as a nonprofit foundation. I guess it was the first educational nonprofit foundation in Cuba. And we uh, turned it, the control of the school over to a board of directors. Apparently, this was the first non-for-profit 
organization ever created in Cuba. Cuba. So the document starts out with this long preamble explaining what it is. in yeah. legal terms yeah. <laughs> what a non-for-profit is and how it really doesn't do this and how it's a two or three pages of very, very technical legal jargon. My parents gave up rights of inheritance, which is what Mr. Rustin had set up, so that this foundation could be created and basically be the, the owner uh, of the school. And that, that is, I think, a, a fact that very few people re realize, that yes, it was a private school, but it wasn't privately owned. Uh, it was owned within a nonprofit structure. Although plans for a new school facility were in Mr. Baker's mind before the nonprofit foundation, their help made the dream come true. The new Rustin Academy opened in a nine-acre site in Alturas del Country Club area on September 1955. Most of the money used for the purchase and construction of the new facility came from the profits of the foundation. Loans and help from the Rustin Academy community provided the final funding for the new school. One of my father's dreams was to establish the resources to build a school that was really designed as a school and not as a series of private homes. The new facility was designed by the firm of Arroyo y Menendez that had also designed El Palacio de los Deportes in 1957, the Havana Hilton in 1958, and the Teatro Nacional in 1960. Gabriela Menendez, a Ruston graduate, and the first woman architect in Cuba fully understood the philosophy of the school. Together with Mr. Baker, they preserved the valuable aspects of the He y Quinta spaces that often, by informal ways, influenced curricular goals and achieved Mr. Ruston's dreams of the school. She evidently understood Ruston very well because the the spaces that were at Ruston, uh, the fact that in the primary grades you had the classrooms fully enclosed with cross ventilation, a covered terrace, and then an open garden for each classroom was a very interesting way to deal with education. When the new Ruston Academy opened, its buildings Landscapes and facilities reflected all the innovative philosophy, pedagogy, and curriculum that Mr. Rustin had introduced. He was fortunate to find in the Bakers the ones to carry out his unique legacy. A school and the education that takes place within its walls requires both a conducive and creative environment nurtured by its teachers. Rustin Academy provided both as plans began to take shape, an American architectural firm reviewed the plans and recommended an idea taken from the old Ruston Academy in El Vedado. My dad had never realized that the patio mm -hmm. of the main building was about 50% of the Ruston student experience. That's where we interacted. That's mm -hmm. where you picked up a lot of the cross-cultural stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. And the architect said, well, Jim, do you, have you thought about your patios? And he said, well, patios have always just, they're just noise for me. <laughs> well, his office was right off the patio. So. <laughs> <laughs> but the architect said, no, 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 no. <laughs> that is, I, I there, you have a spirit in this school that I can't design into a building. One of the things that I think is true of the new Ruston Academy is that it was a modern interpretation of the elements of a traditional Spanish colonial house, as was the case of the old Ruston, which was an agglomeration of old houses in El Vedado, and how the basic elements of those Cuban colonial homes were interpreted and synthesized in the modern idiom to become 
the new school. Well, we moved to the new, new, new building uh, near in La Coronela, near where we lived. It was just a phenomenal facility with beautiful grounds, with baseball fields, basketball fields. And I lived and breathed sports, Cuban music, and Cuban food. What else do you want? That's, that's, that's the whole, that's Rust of the Cat. Right? In the new home, the realization of the perfect synergy between building and curriculum, both formal and informal, became a daily source of joy, pride, and happiness for all those involved, students, parents, teachers, and administrators. Mr. Rustin had started it all with successful innovations in the 1920s through the 40s. In the 1950s, with Mr. Baker at the helm, the curriculum was unique and complex, completely bilingual, bicultural, multicultural, co-ed, and non-sectarian. Values were imbued throughout in an environment that produced mutual understanding and tolerance. Uh, Mr. Rustin all of a sudden goes to Cuba and opens a coeducational school. Coeducation was not a particularly practiced type of, of education in Cuba in the 1920s or the 30s or the 40s. I think a very good thing that uh, Rustin was bilingual and was co-ed and there were other religions, people from other places and religions, so that at a very early stage, we learned to, to behave and, and to be respected and be respected in a very easy and manner. I value the diversity that we had at Rust, where everybody was a family, where we had people coming in from all sorts of, of, of venues in life. We had um, Americans, we had Cubans, we had Chinese, we had Jewish people. So it was a nice mix. Uh, we were exposed to different cultures. Uh, there was no uh, anti-Semitism that I ever experienced. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of my friends uh, came to my bar mitzvah. To me, that's the normal way. And thank God that we had that mix because we became very social. Uh, there was a lot of respect for each other. Values that were not systematically taught, but we learned them. Uh, that idea of, of doing the best you can, of, 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 being, uh, of pursuing excellence, the idea of we're all the same. Uh, there's no difference between the position of one, uh, one student uh, or another. Uh, there was a, a, a whole idea of equality and respect for others, uh, tolerance. Many times we try to say that Ruston was a bicultural or bi lingual school, and I think it was bicultural because it, it, it gave you an opportunity, and this is very important to me, an opportunity to retain your roots while uh, adopting another culture. There was also this idea that the school was not bilingual per se, it was multicultural. And we ended up very early in our years in primary school uh, with, with kids, kids from England, kids from Italy, uh, kids from, from Sweden. And I, I, that gave us a, 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 a view of the world uh, that was not typical of this little island that had maybe five million uh, inhabitants uh, or for that matter of schools in Havana. We were receiving and uh, practicing multicultural education when the terms weren't even used in an educational context uh, of the times. So it wasn't just the formal curriculum that dealt with that, it was primarily our extra curricular activities that achieved this. What it did have, of course, was a mix of foreigners that the other schools really didn't yeah. have which many of the parents who sent their children to Ruston 
saw this as a great advantage. There was a desire for um, higher education and a desire to learn about American culture. And uh, I think uh, there was, that was a common denominator of both. Uh, and, and the reverse would be true of the American students who were learning about Cuban culture. We had American friends, we had Cuban friends. You know, they, there was no, there was no, you know, tension. We're just total friends. Eventually what turned out, frankly, was a melting pot. In other words, uh, and I'm not the one who has said this before, but it's been said that the Cubans became Americanized and the Americans became Cubanized. I think we felt very much like Cuban. I think of Cuba even today as my home. There are a lot of things that Ruston gave us. Uh, I think that the most important thing that Ruston did for us was to build our character. Nobody knew if somebody was rich or uh, was part of a scholarship or whatever. That didn't influence at all the, um, the way that uh, friends were created. Not at all. Ruston was unique because uh, it was not an aristocracy. Uh, I believe Ruston was more a meritocracy. If you came to school on the school bus or whether you came to school or driven by a private chauffeur, it didn't make any difference. If you didn't meet the academic standards, they would ask you to leave. The reason I attended Ruston was because my father was employed by Ruston as part of the maintenance uh, crew for the building. And uh, as part of their deal, the children of the employees at Ruston were offered scholarships. And I must say that I believe very few people at Ruston knew that I, was, I had a scholarship. I was just part of the group. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Baker made sure of that. And I will always remember them with so, so much love. I, I uh, once told a friend that in, in Ruston Academy, the gardener merited the same respect that the director of the school did. The sense of family relocated to the new facilities and students benefited from it. The faculty at Ruston Academy had a high degree of independence, creativity, and the freedom to innovate, which were critical to education at Ruston. In high school, one teacher introduced his students to poetry by exposing them to folk songs. In bachillerato, another rewarded her students by reading them Edgar Allan Poe. One of the resident teachers offered an informal lunchtime introduction to philosophy on the porch of the residential area. And home teaching took on a new meaning when a math teacher worked with seniors preparing for the SAT exams every Saturday in the dining room of her home on a completely free basis. With these and many other examples, the Ruston dream was taking shape. Marta Ferrer in mathematics, everybody knows that uh, she ran a, for anybody that was going to college, uh, she would uh, hold a class at her home on Saturdays, Saturday mornings. We'd show up about eight o'clock and we'd leave about 12 or 12.30. Goldenberg, uh, he was quite a fellow. He was a fascinating person. He was a, a graduate or had gone to Heidelberg. Uh, he, he taught us history, okay, but then he pulled about six of us aside and he formed a Socratic group that met during lunch and talked about philosophical subjects. So we, we got into philosophy, something you don't normally do in high school. Sybil Baker, as director of the lower school, contributed significantly to the initial individual-centered nurturing curriculum. She created a plan to improve academic skills, integrating extracurricular activities that enriched the student's experience. She taught music, came to the classes and had the students read poetry. She produced the plays and conducted the choral groups. This approach also included students learning carpentry, 
leather work, and taking art classes. Bess said in the words of a student, she knew every one of us and made Ruston truly our second home. With that wonderful laugh of hers, she let us know we were in a great place. I think that um, th there were two things that made Ruston unique. One was the fact that, uh, as far as I ever perceived, everybody liked Ruston. And the second thing was that you learned because you wanted to learn. Uh, somehow, we were not made to learn things at whatever discipline it was. We were always encouraged and it was always, there was always a desire on our part to achieve. I always felt, even as a child, that my experience at Ruston was unique. I remember that very much so because it, it also uh, uh, brings to my mind the teachers that I had in primary, in my primary grades. And the fact that the experiences in the classroom and outside of the classroom were experiences that um, contributed to, to making me um, see education not as a burdensome responsibility at the time of being, you know, when you're a child, but as a, as a, as a pleasant, joyful experience. I learned uh, even new ways of doing things that has even influenced me to this day. Uh, for example, you probably know that uh, in Latin America, we don't tend to be very punctual. <laughs> but at Ruston, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, they applied uh, the uh, American culture of punctuality, the importance of punctuality. And if we came late uh, to class, uh, we had to get uh, a late slip. We would not be allowed back in class until uh, we uh, got this late slip. Diverse tracks facilitated the curriculum goal of individualization to match student interests and abilities. The upper school's architecture reflected the diverse programs. Then the other thing that I think Mr. Russon committed to was to provide education for both sides. And what I mean by this is that there were, once you got beyond the grade school level, there were two separate, actually three, three separate tracks. There was a high school, which was modeled entirely after the American high school system, which was really a preparation for college. It was the equivalent of a college prep school. Mm -hmm. On the other side was a system that was entirely modeled to the Cuban secondary education called the bachillerato. And that was to prepare students to take the official uh, Cuban examinations that they had to pass and prepare them for Cuban universities. And then he recognized a third need, which was there are a group of people who would benefit tremendously from the bilingual experience, but who weren't necessarily on the way to university. And they had, we called it comercio. And what it did is prepare people, it prepared people who were gonna become executive secretaries, accountants, business people. We studied everything there was to study in the Commerce Department, not only did we learn the skills that we needed to succeed in an office, but we also knew geography and we knew history and we knew current events. We had, uh, we were very diversified. Mr. Rustin believed in the thorough mastery of academic skills and the importance of providing a background of knowledge wide enough to nourish and illuminate. His students knew the discipline of hard work and the joy of achievement. The students learned how to use their mind, to use languages correctly, to find solutions to problems, and relate the past to the present, the present to the future. Learning by doing, an important instructional strategy, was illustrated in the emphasis given to the role that extracurricular activities and sports played in developing leadership and character, moral compass in the students. Collaboration, respect for diverse ideas and tolerance for divergent views as taught in the classroom influenced student conduct. 
Mr. Reston's legacy continued vividly with the Bakers and with each and every teacher who taught at Reston. When I was at uh, MIT, I think, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, there were at least four or five students from Ruston at MIT. And that is one little school in one little country. In 1972, I picked up a New York Times magazine that was talking about the best prep schools in the United States. And after they went through the list of about five or six, it said, we would be remiss if we did not mention Ruston Academy, a school in Cuba, which has been closed now for, I don't know, 15 years. And it was the equal of any of these. And why was Ruston so good? Why was it? on a teaching basis uh, better than Stanford, than MIT and Harvard, the three major institutions uh, where I spent uh, my life before coming to Miami. And the main thing that differentiated Ruston from any other in in educational institution I've been involved with is the passion as well as the ability of the professors. And if you talk to the students, they will tell you it was the teachers who challenged us. The difference between Ruston and other schools in terms of what they do to prepare us was that they demanded your best. We had teachers throughout, throughout our, our, our stay there that showed us character. The teachers were excellent. Uh, they uh, taught me uh, to, to be tenacious, uh, integrity. Uh, they, they made uh, learning a lot of fun. The teachers were always very, very aware of what we were doing and how we were doing. And uh, we were always very aware of, the, of our teachers. Well, I think the teachers at Ruston were better. They were more di had more diverse backgrounds. They were available to the students and really cared for them. I think the students on, at the same time were more highly motivated by the teachers. And um, overall, I think the educational experience was a much stronger one at Ruston than at most other schools. I was so touched by the kindness and the patience of the teachers that I don't think it was too difficult. It was an excellent school. There was not one teacher who was not trying to make us learn. And it was, it was a blessing we could learn. They helped me out you know, with my schooling. They were always ready to listen. They cared about the pupils. They gave them a sense of being important to them. And that I will treasure always. Even though the student body had increased more than tenfold, the school's chief concern was still the individual student and their development. Events surrounding the post-Second World War era emphasized the importance of developing responsible citizens and the curriculum focused more attention on helping students understand methods of solving problems. One of the things that I think is part of the philosophy that I'm sure goes back to Mr. Reston, but certainly my parents were instrumental in maintaining it, was the philosophy that the most important part of education is to teach someone to think. Uh, I've been a university president, and I still uh, can tell you that it was that basic knowledge that I learned at uh, Ruston that has guided me uh, throughout my life. I think that the, the education that Mr. Ruston brought to Cuba was unique. He was a man way ahead of his time, even in the United States. With an increasing number of students, new teachers were often recruited from the ranks of graduates. These alumni reinforced further the Ruston cultural heritage and values that students embraced. Tough academics and challenging curriculum in an environment of exceptional and loving teachers. On, on the bachillerato side, uh, it was interesting to see that there were a number of students 
who had graduated from Ruston uh, that eventually returned to Ruston as teachers. Another group of alumni, the parents in the second generation in the family attending Ruston, were important and active collaborators in fostering the Ruston culture. My, my parents met at Ruston. My mother graduated in 41. My mother, Dorotea Chapiro de Tannenbaum, also started a kindergarten with Mr. Ruston. And uh, till the day she died, which was February of last year, uh, at 99 years old, she bled Ruston. So there was no choice. <laughs> All four of us were gonna go to Ruston. Under the direction of James D. Baker as headmaster of the school, the goals established by Mr. Ruston remained unchanged. As an example, the annual Shakespearean play continued to be produced according to tradition with the involvement of students, faculty, staff, and many parents sewing costumes. Also, innovations and high expectations went hand in hand with academic life. Mr. Ruston had certainly introduced plenty of both in his time. Now it was Mr. Baker's turn. He required and taught all graduating seniors in the high school and the combined bachillerato and high school degree programs, the college level semantics course with a textbook by Samuel Hayakawa. The mere mention of the name Hayakawa inspired dread, but what a badge of honor it was for those seniors to succeed in that course. We used to call it uh, the course uh, just plainly, you know, Hayakawa. And uh, I still have here with me uh, the original book that I, uh, uh, you know, used uh, at Ruston. And I still, to this day, I uh, read it from time to time. I also remember Hayakawa. And uh, this was a course that only those who were seniors in high school or in the Bachillerato High School Combination Program who were allowed to take this course. But that course actually wasn't taught at the high school level anywhere. In the United States, it was taught at the college level. The miracle of Ruston did not happen by accident, but by hard work of all those involved. Among some of the innovative practices that made Ruston unique were the Parents and Teachers Association and the Alumni Association. But Mr. Rustin and Mr. Baker knew that the key to success was the partnership of the teachers, students, parents, and administrators' commitment to demonstrating to each student his personal involvement in their academic and personal progress. And there is this interesting concept of partnership. Mr. Rustin met with every single student, and they go through the report card. And Mr. Rustin would say, oh, you're doing very well here, but you know, what's happening over here? He knew every single student and what their needs were in order to make, uh, the needs that needed to be addressed in order to, to allow this student to attain the level that he had capability of reaching. Oh, I met Mr. Rustin every month when he looked at the report cards. Yeah. Yeah. That was a pleasure, too, because he read the report card very carefully. And then he looked at your face and he said, you can do better. <laughs> you know, he, he knew what was the limit, what we could do. When our, when our report cards came out, they didn't just get handed out. Everybody sits there, okay? And here's Mr. Russell. You go over and you sit next to him. The nicest of people. You know, he'd, he'd look over your report card and say, you doing okay here? And what, how about this? What happened here? You know? And he'd go over personally, kid by kid. And he was fabulous. He did that with every child in the school. Nineteen fifty nine began with uncertainty as terrifying events threatened Mr. Rustin's dream, the Baker's life work, and the very existence of Rustin Academy. A nightmare began to envelop the island. By december thirty first, nineteen sixty, 
the Cuban government had expelled the majority of the personnel of the American embassy. By then, most of the American and international students had left, many Cubans also. The embassy was closed, and four days later, Mr. and Mrs. Baker left for Miami. A skeleton crew continued to operate the school until early May 1961, when Ruston Academy was confiscated by the communist government. Those who lived through it remember the painful times. So Cuba was home to me, and I expected to spend the rest of my life there. In fact, I said at the time I left in January of 61, I was a Cuban-American who was leaving home also. I think easier for us than it was for our parents. I mean, we still had a life in front of us. Right. They had devoted their lives mm -hmm. to doing, to building something that was remarkable, and then, you know, it was lost. I'd come out of Cuba with five suitcases of clothes, and I had no money here, and two sons in college. I had the privilege and the sadness of probably being the last student to visit the school the day the school was intervened, which I think was May the 2nd of 1961, I went to the school. And the enormous set of driving away and, and seeing, going uphill and, and watching the school and, and, and telling to myself, this is it, man, you know? There's no more Ruston. And the, the sadness was awful. The building was no longer there to be our pride and joy, but the spirit of Ruston Academy and of James D. Baker was not trampled by the actions of the Cuban government. Mr. Baker, by the time he left, prompted by parents who were worried about the future of their children, became one of the initiators of Operación Pedro Pan. The underground network organized by Mr. Baker in Cuba was motivated by the need to get the children out of the country due to the pervading fear of communism that permeated Cuba at the time. Two Ruston teachers, Margarita Oteiza and Berta Finlay, as well as leaders of American corporations in Cuba, assisted Mr. Baker in this very dangerous work. Monsignor Brian Walsh was Mr. Baker's contact in Miami. With his help, over 14,000 unaccompanied Cuban children were brought to the United States. Operation Pedro Pan really came about as a result of uh, the fact that, that um, my parents, uh, particularly my father, uh, had a very unique relationship with many Cuban parents. Uh, and those parents, or some of those parents, approached my father because they were concerned about the, whether, whether their children were going to be indoctrinated in one form or another uh, through Cuban education programs. Many of them talked to me very honestly. In late November of 1960, a uh, father who I knew was very much involved with the underground came to me and asked me if I could get a scholarship for his son to study in the States. And I said, uh, sorry, but not that time of year. But then he explained to me that he had, uh, he and some of his friends who were in, in the, working in the underground were willing to face all the dangers that they were facing, but they were worried that if uh, they were, something happened and they were arrested, thrown in prison, their children might be sent to Russia because that was what happened in the Spanish Revolution. I thought about this for a couple of weeks and then I decided to go to Miami and see if I could get some help. Because at that time, a lot of the heads of American companies, especially those in Havana, were in Miami waiting to come back. Because everybody thought that they would be coming back soon. And so I went over and talked to a group of them explained this problem and they said, well, if you can uh, find a place to open a school, we will, our companies will support it. So I began looking around for the possibilities and someone said, well, see Father Walsh, who's the head of Catholic Welfare. When I saw Ca uh, Father Walsh, I was very happy to find out that he was already negotiating with the government, the U.S. government, to uh, set up a plan for a program like this. And I was uh, attending Ruston Academy until I was 17 years old. And in December of 1960, 
I left Cuba um, uh, as one of the children in the uh, program that Mr. Baker uh, worked on to help uh, uh, Cuban children to escape the communist regime in Cuba. I spent from er early January to I guess the end of May, April, at the airport about 12 to 15 hours a day because I was there to receive any children that might come in. As the Cuban revolution evolved into an unpopular communist government, many families left Cuba for a land of freedom. As many Restonians arrived in the United States or elsewhere, they faced unforeseen trouble as they left behind a country of intense natural beauty, a beloved school, classmates, and in some cases, their family. Their adaptation to a new country, in spite of the financial and other hardships experienced, was filled with pride and gratitude for the rest in education that sustained them in the workplace or pursuing educational goals. Because of all that I learned in, in school when I came to this country, I think my life was a little bit easier. I could work in an office instead of going to sew, because I didn't know how to sew. But, you know, a lot of the Cubans, when we first came at the beginning, and they didn't know the language, what could we do? But fortunately, I did. And I had, uh, since I went to the Commerce Department, I had my typing and my shorthand in both Spanish and in English, and I was able to work in an office. I was very, very lucky thanks to the education that I received of Roston. When I came here, I applied for a job with an attorney in downtown Miami. And uh, I was one of many applicants, but they told me after they hired me that they had never seen the level of the way that I spoke English, my knowledge, my shorthand, and my typing was impeccable. And I landed the job at $55 a week, and it was a fortune. We get to Winter Haven, and uh, we were the only Cuban family there, and we were totally bilingual. I was just the beginning of sixth grade. I didn't do much in sixth grade, but I got straight A's. And uh, those straight A's were based on the education that I had, that I had at Ruston. But what Ruston gave me was the appreciation of learning, uh, when I started in ninth grade at Nautilus Junior High School in Miami Beach, I was pretty well ahead of my class. Uh, and I think the education in Ruston, the fact that they focused on us, all the teachers were top notch. There was no teacher aides or any of that, uh, allowed me to, to continue ahead of my class all through college. So uh, I found uh, in my freshman year in college that many of the courses that I was taking in college, I had already been taught at Ruston. So uh, this was just uh, amazing uh, to see the, the, the level of academic, uh, uh, you know, power, you know, that, uh, that Ruston brought. Uh, the fact that, uh, for example, uh, my course in, in calculus, uh, I had, it was almost like repeating everything that I had at Ruston. There were some restrictions at the time. You could only bring so much money out and uh, one suitcase per person. But I think that possibly the most valuable thing we brought, uh, especially uh, when it came to Josie and myself, was our Ruston education. Mr. Rustin and his successor, Mr. Baker, left a legacy, the pursuit of excellence. This trademark of a Rustin education is documented in the academic and professional life of the students, presidents of major universities in Florida and California, a vice president of PepsiCo, educators, doctors, lawyers, ministers, a bishop, directors of US government departments, journalists, architects, 
business owners and entrepreneurs, and the list goes on, including a pilot member of the pilot roster serving Air Force One. These men and women, when asked, would always credit their Ruston Academy education and the teachers who had influenced them. I believe the Ruston Academy gave me a value system that has basically been a, a guideline for my life. I think that one of the most important things that helped Ruston be so successful was the people that went to school there. After I graduated, I went to work for a um, global company uh, and uh, I traveled uh, throughout Latin America. The education that they gave me is what really uh, has allowed me to uh, achieve, you know, what I have today. The legacy of Ruston Academy, as Mr. Ruston and later Mr. Baker envisioned, became part of the life work of some Ruston alumni. By 1975, many of them were well established in their careers, and Mr. Baker, with the help of Margarita Oteiza, organized a small team of Rustonians to work in the creation of a database of names and addresses that now amount to over 3,000 alumni, parents, and teachers. For the first reunion, 500 gathered from all over the world in the United States. The event honored Mr. and Mrs. Baker in gratitude for the education we had received. I think one of the great things about Ruston has been the reunions, because basically leaving Cuba where we all knew each other and going to the U.S. and many other places, we lost track. But the reunions have been very helpful in terms of reconnecting with people Reunions continued to be held, but with every reunion, a basic topic of discussion came to be part of each gathering. The return to Cuba and bringing Ruston Academy back to a democratic Cuba. This idea motivated the founding of the Ruston Baker Educational Institution, or RBEI for its initials, founded in 1992. And then in, 90, in 92, we established an American board, a uh, nonprofit organization called Fran uh, Russian Baker Educational Institution with the idea that this group would carry on the work of Ruston and work to reopen the school whenever it would be possible to do so. Dad became active and I worked very closely with, with, with him on this, uh, of resuscitating the board of the Fundacion Rustin Baker, that's mm. the Cuban foundation, mm. uh, with the idea that uh, we would possibly be able to return to Cuba to reclaim the property mm. and to reopen a Rustin Academy there. And of course, one of the things that's, that uh, is challenging about our new Rustin, which we hope to have someday, is that uh, one of our very important jobs is going to be to try to help people understand what democracy is and to help prepare for democracy. With the passing of time, the return of Ruston Academy to a democratic Cuba did not materialize. Instead, the board established new goals focused on documenting the value and importance of a Ruston education. Mr. Baker, with his son Chris, and others helping them, authored the book, Rustin from Dreams to Reality, capturing as much as possible the legacy of those who made the school and the programs that so effectively educated its students. The Rustin Baker Educational Institution continued the reunions and other activities that kept the memories vibrant and joyful, while also assuring the preservation of our legacy by collecting organizing and donating official documents, yearbooks, photographs, and other materials to the Cuban Heritage Collection of the University of Miami Libraries. To support the work of the library to organize and make accessible these records, individual alumni and RBEI made donations in memory of the teachers, the Baker family, and in honor of Hiram and Martha Rustin. And 
I think that there is a very important direction that, that we took several years ago of defining part of what we're trying to, to accomplish is leaving a clear record of our legacy in the area of education. We hope that we leave um, uh, for, other, for, for other generations the merit and the value of this education so that it can be um, emulated. And we're, uh, as they say in Spanish, poniendo nuestro granito de arena uh, in this effort to share. Uh, what we did can't be replicated the way it was done in Cuba, but there's an awful lot that can be learned from that experience. To the class of 1957, some consider this a season of farewells, but to me, it is a happy time. I think not of your leaving, but of your taking Rustin with you wherever you may go. May her spirit and the ideals of character, personal values, and citizenship which Rustin has given you remain a basic part of your future and of your life of service. J.D. Baker. Mm -hmm.